uh, okay. Uh, a few years ago, I, I remember being thoroughly disappointed um, by my holiday reading. In fact, I was devastated uh, by my holiday reading. I had taken, in my wisdom and in a rush, I had taken one solitary book away with me on holiday. All of my hopes were pinned to this one solitary book, and it was uh, a novel, and it was set in uh, a 14th century, is it 14th century? It was, yep, 14th century French village, okay, which might not sound exciting to you, but when you're sitting in an ancient French village reading it, it takes on a little bit of a charm. And the first chapter of my holiday reading was marvelous. It was gripping. It was exciting. The first chapter set the story up well, I thought, introduced me to the main characters, and I was getting excited for my holiday reading, and then it happened. I turned the page, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw that the next couple of chapters, they only contained... You ready for this? The list of food consumption in that French village in the year in question. That was it. This is my holiday reading. This is my downtime. This is my time to relax. And what do I have? Chapters filled with grain consumption (laughs) in a French village in the year 14 or 1347. My hopes were dashed. I had gone from this potentially gripping thing, this exciting book, to suddenly being faced with the mundane. Well, could be that you're feeling something like that this morning here at St. Peter's. Last week, we were in one of the high places in God's Word, weren't we? Do you remember last week, that beautiful Trinitarian portion of Scripture? Last week, we heard this voice from heaven as the Father spoke to the Son in the presence, of course, of the Holy Spirit of God. And then what happens? This morning, we turn the page. And okay, it's not a list of grain that we've got in front of us, but it is a list of names. And so you could be forgiven for thinking that what we have here is equally as dull, equally mundane. I would ask you, please, uh, at the outset here to remember what we've got in our hands here. Please, for the duration this morning, remember that this is God-authored. What you have here, this list, this is God-breathed. This is not just a list of, 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 of names. And I want to try and be clear about what we're going to do and how we're going to approach things this morning. I want to aim for clarity here. So this is the first thing. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to address the question, what exactly is this? Because, it, do you know, it is not as, as clear-cut as it may seem. So that's the first thing we do. We address, what well, this is a list of names, but what exactly is this? Second thing that we're going to do is we're going to to look from above and we're going to note a couple of general, simple observations about this list of names, okay? So establish what it is, then we'll note a couple of general, simple observations. Then the third thing, (coughs) excuse me, what we'll do is we'll try to establish what is the author's main point, Luke's main point with this list. Is everyone clear? Yep, well, I try and address what it is. We'll, tr- we'll look at it, make some observations about it, a couple of observations, and then we'll try and establish what is the main point. So if you, if you have a copy of a Scripture, a, a physical book, or on your phone, please turn there. Let's g- get to Luke chapter 3, and let's ask that first question. Do you remember what it was? Well, let's ask, what exactly is this? What is this we have in front of us? <clears throat> I read something uh, this week on the internet that had me in hysterics. I read something fantastic on the internet this week. So apparently it was a a young woman, uh, or maybe not that young, uh, in America, uh, perhaps in a backwater in the sticks in America. And uh, she, she is asking a question. You know how some people love to ask the internet questions and ask Google questions? 
This woman had uh, recently discovered that she was pregnant with twins. And so she decides to ask the internet a question. Ready for the question? I've just discovered I'm having twins. Will my pregnancy last nine months or 18 months? <laughs> I love it. Well, I'll be pregnant for 18 months because I'm having twins. Well, I wonder what you think of this first heading. I'm ask, asking you, what is this in our hands? Perhaps you're thinking like that lady. Perhaps you're thinking this is a stupid question to ask. But I want you to, to understand that it is truly and properly a legitimate thing uh, to, to try and, and to ask here. So we know, I would hope, that there is another list in the Bible, in the New Testament, that purports to be Jesus' genealogy. Do we know that? We know that Matthew's gospel begins with such a list. And here's the issue. Perhaps you can see it already. Where Matthew and Luke, they agree in their names that they record from Abraham to King David. So two genealogies that agree Matthew and Luke, they agree, from Abraham to King David. You ready for the problem? The problem is from King David to Jesus, these two lists are completely divergent. They're completely different. Matthew's genealogy, Luke's uh, genealogy from David to Jesus are, are completely different. And so we are forced, aren't we, this morning, as we turn to Luke to, to ask, well, what does that mean for what we have in our hands? What is this? And <clears throat> lest you're in danger already this morning of, of switching off, I want you to understand that this is not just a technicality. This is not just a question, uh, a, a technical question. This is important for your witness to Jesus Christ. This is important for, for even apologetics. I want the, the students to hear this as well. See, we are often told, we often hear that there are so many contradictions in the Bible. We hear that, don't we? Especially when we're young, especially when we're at university. There's contradictions in the biblical text all over the place. And, and, and so many people point to these genealogies as perhaps the chief example of the, an apparent contradiction. They'll say, you daft Christians. You, you, you can't even get Jesus' lineage right. There's, there's contradictions between Matthew and Luke. So, do you see? We have to be right with us. So what is this that we have in our hands? I want to put to you two of the most likely answers to that question. Two. Will you get them? First is this. What we have in Luke's gospel, number one, could be a record of the bloodline of Joseph, Mary's husband. This could be the bloodline of Joseph, Mary's husband. I want you, if you can bear it for a second, to think about Prince Harry. If you can bear to do that for a moment. Um, Prince Harry, as, as we know, has been in the news an awful lot in recent times, hasn't he? And because of this, there's been a lot of talk about what exactly is driving uh, his clear frustration with his family. I think everybody knows by now that Prince Harry's not that happy with his family. We've picked up on that. And so some people are speculating, what, what's caused that unhappiness or that apparent bitter, bitterness? And some people are saying or suggesting, well, it could be down to his place in the line of succession. There's such a thing as sibling rivalry, isn't there? And his elder brother is next in line to the throne. And so some people are speculating, oh, perhaps he's not best pleased uh, about this. And perhaps it's this that is driving him, uh, driving him crazy. That is important for our discussion here this morning. See, how good is your memory? Last year, at some point, we looked at Matthew's genealogy together. I wonder if you remember what we saw. We saw that there was this focus on King David in Matthew. Do you remember? We saw that, that clearly what Matthew was doing is tracing the royal line of succession right down to Jesus. Does everybody get that? 
So Matthew's gospel, not, not tracing the, the, the natural line, not tracing the blood line. What does Matthew do in Matthew 1? He traces the legal line, the, the line of succession, the kingly line. In fact, to keep you awake, let's look at verse 31. And you'll see it for yourself. You'll see, see what Matthew does, he traces the royal line where Luke, what Luke is doing, he's tracing the, the family line. Now look at verse 31. Remember what Matthew does. If he's tracing, if Matthew is tracing the royal line, the kingly line, he goes from David to whom? Who's the king that comes after David? Matthew records David to Solomon, doesn't he? But look, look what we have here in verse 31. What does Luke do? Do you notice that he goes from David to Nathan. He is not tracing the royal line, the, law, the line of succession. Luke is clearly doing something else. He is tracing a bloodline, most likely, or perhaps as some say, the bloodline of Joseph. Now, I, I want to say this at this point, that uh, I reckon this suggestion that Luke is, is tracing the bloodline of, of Joseph. I think that's a good idea. I think that might very well be correct. This could be today, this long line that Will has wrestled with. This could be the bloodline of, of Joseph. It, it, it could be. But I, I do think I need to bring to you a second alternative, which is much more traditional. And this goes back to about the third century. I want you all to get it. What we could have in our hands is the bloodline of Mary, the bloodline of Mary. I'm looking around at you, and I know that there's a few, uh, there's a few visitors in the life of the church this morning, but most of you are regular at St. Peter's, aren't you? And most of you have been here for the, the early sermons in Luke's gospel. You have, right? So as I say to you that this could be the bloodline of Mary, what do you think, Christian friend? What I would hope is that immediately you think that fits thematically with the beginning of Luke's gospel. Isn't that what you think? If this is to do with Mary? I mean, think about Matthew's gospel. What happens at the beginning? Who's, who's in focus at the beginning of Matthew's gospel? We know this, don't we? We know it's Joseph. Who does the angel appear to? It's, it's Joseph, isn't it? Joseph's in focus. But what have we seen in the past number of weeks, past number of months, who does the angel appear to in Luke's gospel? Mary, and, 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 and we've traced her journey to Elizabeth, and we've heard even from, we've even heard Mary sing in a song. Do you see? This idea that this is the bloodline of Mary, it, it certainly fits thematically, but there are a couple of problems with this thesis, and I'm pretty sure if you're awake and you're switched on, you see the first problem, don't you? What's the problem with this thesis that it's Mary's bloodline? Mary's not mentioned. <laughs> Mary's name, Will did not read out Mary's name. It doesn't appear here. So does this not rule this idea out? Well, well no, Christian friend, it doesn't. Because what do we know? We know that in the ancient world, in the Jewish world in particular, it was absolutely not the done thing to record a woman's name in a genealogy. It wasn't. What did the Jews do? They kept it to the men's names in a list like this. And okay, Matthew broke that rule, didn't he? But he did so to make a very specific theological point about the fallen nature of Jesus' life. So maybe it is Luke is adhering to this tradition. And just check out verse 23. If we could look at that together. And I would ask you to put yourself in Luke's shoes for a minute. Would you do this? Now imagine you're tasked with writing a genealogy. Just imagine that. And imagine you want to record Mary's bloodline, but you are not allowed by convention and tradition to mention Mary. How would you go about doing it? What might you say if you want to communicate to your readers, this is actually, this is actually Mary's bloodline. How could you do it? You could perhaps write, Jesus the son, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, the son as was supposed of Joseph. 
Perhaps Luke's whispering to his readership, this is actually Mary's bloodline. So that's one problem to the side. There is, though, another problem because we've got verse 23 up here. Can I ask you just to focus on five, five words that we've got on the screen? Five. You ready for them? Here they are. And think about them with me. He says, Joseph, what's the next bit? Joseph, the son of Heli. Now, is that not an insurmountable problem, Christian friends? I mean, Luke is saying, this, this, is, this is, you know, Joseph is the son of Heli, and then he records the ancestry of Heli. Doesn't that rule out this being Mary's bloodline? No. Just listen to this. In the original language, it doesn't say that Joseph is the son of Heli. In the, in the original language, it says this, that, that Joseph is off Heli. He's off Heli. And so many, many people for hundreds of years have thought that what could be in view here is a practice that was common in the ancient world, similar to leveret marriage. So the idea, you, you just think for a moment about Mary's family, okay? So here's the idea. What would happen is that the dad, so let's say Mary's dad, if he does not have sons, if he only has daughters, what was common in the ancient world was for him to adopt his son-in-law. So who would that be? That would be Heli adopting Joseph. And it was a way of keeping this, his line, Heli's line, going. And you might be looking at me thinking, oh, that sounds far-fetched. Ah, two things. One, elsewhere in the Bible, Joseph's father's name is recorded. It's not Heli, it's Jacob. Another thing, Jewish history records the name of Mary's dad. It's in the Talmud. Any guesses? Mary's name, Mary's father's name, Heli. We very well could have before us the bloodline of Mary. I know it's complicated. <laughs> I know it's complicated. Can you imagine sermon preparation this week? Waking up at two o'clock in the morning, Shealtiel, the son of Nay. <laughs> nay. Oh, I, oh I, I, I know that this is technical and it's complicated. But, but believe me when I say to you that two wonderful things rise out of all that has been said. Two things. Number one that rises out of this. Ready? We have absolutely no reason in the world, therefore, to doubt the validity of the biblical text. So the world says, ah, but Matthew's genealogy and, and Luke's genealogy, they're contradictory, aren't they? And we say, no, they're doing different things. One is tracing a line of succession to a throne. The other is tracing a bloodline. Do you see? No reason to doubt the validity of the text. Second thing, and I love it. I love it. Do you see if this second thesis is correct about Mary? Do you see what that means? It means that Jesus of Nazareth had a double claim to the throne of Israel. Don't you see that? A double claim in both Matthew's line of royal succession from, from David right through through Solomon, all the heirs, as though the, the Davidic kingship continued on leading to Jesus in both that royal line, but also... If it's Mary in his bloodline, in both Jesus with his double claim on the throne, who is this Jesus but the true and proper Davidic king? He is the king of kings. Isn't it marvelous? We look at it and it's a, what is it? A list of names that it should see us all bow before Jesus as king and as Lord. So what is this? Secondly, much more briefly, let's notice a couple of general observations. And I'll change gear. Okay, we, we change gear. That was complex. It was difficult. Let's just rise up a little bit. Let's go above this text for a moment. Let's look down upon it, bird's eye view of the text. And as a church, let's just make a couple of observations and they are simple observations about uh, this list. Two, number one, 
Let's notice that this is Jesus' list. This is Jesus' list. It's Jesus' genealogy. And here I want to tell you a very, very quick story uh, that I, I, I read a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> it is a story about Wycliffe Bible translators. Wycliffe Bible translators. Here's the story. So the, the Bible translators were working in Papua New Guinea, and they were translating Matthew's gospel. Everyone with me so far? Papua New Guinea, working with a particular indigenous people tribe. They are working on Matthew's gospel. They're in a rush. And I, I think we can appreciate that. They're desperate to get the gospel into the hands of this people who have never had scripture in their own tongue. So they make an editorial decision. So they do Matthew's gospel. So here's the decision they make. They decide to skip Matthew 1. They're desperate to get the story of Jesus' birth into the hands of... So let's skip the genealogy. Let's not translate the genealogy. And let's come back to it at a later date. There's, there's, there's the idea. So they do that. Now, sometime later, <coughs> they come back to translate... Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy, and something absolutely marvelous happens. So they translate it, Matthew 1, and they hand it uh, to some of the people from the indigenous tribe who are helping them with their translation. And they read it. These guys read the genealogy and, and the rest of Matthew 1. They read it in their own tongue. And it causes a bit of a stir. And it, then they go away, and they give it to other people in the indigenous tribe. And, and it's caught, they can see, these translators, this is causing something. Is this a problem? Is this a, what's going on here? And then the folk from the tribe come back to the, the Bible translators, and they see this. They say this. They come back. They've got Matthew 1, the genealogy in their hands, and they say, you mean to tell us that these people we've been reading about are real people? They say this. You mean to tell us they're real? Now we believe. Now we believe. Do you see what happened? Like the, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 1 had, had, had brought the gospel alive as it's rooting Jesus in, in time and space and in, and in history. And I think we have to recognize that that is something that's similar. It's happening here in the Gospel of Luke. I'll test your memory again. What's Luke's purpose in writing? We haven't mentioned it in at least two weeks. Why is he writing? He's writing to Theophilus. Do you remember why? That you might have certainty, Theophilus. You know, that you, you believe that you might have assurance. So do you see what Luke's done with that end in view? He's, he's gone away and he has meticulously researched Jesus' lineage. Now the Jews, they had these public records of all of these people traced back to the 12 tribes. Luke's in there meticulously researching it. Why? So that Theophilus might see and there is a sure foundation. There is a historical foundation to his faith. And I think this is important not just for Theophilus. I think it is important for you, Christian friend, because we live in a, such a strange time in, in human history, don't we? We live in a time where the very concept of truth is under attack, isn't it? We're supposed to believe that you've got your truth and I've got my truth and they can be different. You know, we live in an age where stuff like, like gender is, well, is it it's up in the air? Is it something that's not fixed and, and, and real? There's a debate about truth and what is Almighty God doing here this morning with this? Is he not reminding us, assuring us that the good news of the gospel has historical, real, solid foundations, the Lord Jesus Christ has come amongst us. He has come as the Son in flesh. It is real. You can even look at Jesus' lineage and genealogy. So this is what's the first observation. This is, this is Jesus. This is Jesus' list. You, you ready for the second one? Brace yourselves for the second uh, observation. You ready? This is a long list. <laughs> and you all want to say, that's insightful. 
isn't it? You've, you've spent a long time wrestling with this text and you come to us as a congregation with this is a long list. I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean. There is, whenever, whenever we read a biblical genealogy, there is an air of solemnity that accompanies that, that list, isn't there? As Will read out that long list of of names, there are two things that happen as we read that list. One, we are reminded that these people are sinners. Didn't that happen as you went through the list? Terah, an idolater. We get to his name. Abraham, great things with Abraham. What are you reminded? Abraham lied, lied about his wife. You get to the name David. What are you reminded about? You're reminded, ah, he was an adulterer. More, he was a murderer. We're reminded of of that, aren't we? But what else are we reminded about? As you read these lists, you're reminded that they all received the wages for that sin. Aren't you? I mean, this is a long list as you read it, the son of the son of the son of the... This is a long list of people who died. And the students, you you listen to that, you think about it. So it's a one minute. See those people on that list? All those men. Like one minute they were in their 20s and they thought they were just undefeatable, immortal. One minute was like that. And then they just blinked. And the next minute they're on their deathbed. And they're wondering, where did all those intervening years go? It's a long list. But it's a list of of people who who have died. And isn't that for a moment, even for a split second, regardless of your age or stage, isn't it worth your consideration? Like we read a biblical genealogy, and I think we are confronted also with Hebrews chapter 9 and the fact that it is appointed for man to die. Die once then face judgment, like our names. My name, your name, it might be recorded. All it's going to be is a a name in a a family tree somewhere in the decades to come, if that at all. So if you're a Christian and here this morning, do you not immediately praise God for the name that stands at the top of the list? Because who is this Jesus? But the resurrection and the life. This Jesus is the one who has defeated sin, completely removed its sting. That yes, as Christians, our eyes are going to close in death. And I say this a lot, but that will happen very soon for us. But because of Christ, our eyes will then open and we will be in the immediate presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what? The church, we can laugh Even when it's a serious subject like this, we can laugh in the face of death. We can laugh because we know that in Jesus Christ, it is through death that joy indescribable awaits for the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the last thing this morning. So we've seen what it is. We've noted a couple of things about it. It's Jesus' list. It's real. It's sure. It's a long list. But the last thing is the main point that Luke's making here, the main point. Um, uh, I hope you remember that in the early part of the sermon series, what we were doing was playing spot the difference. You can remember that, do you? Do you remember what Luke does? He alternates, doesn't he, between stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. Then it's back to John the Baptist and Jesus. And what did we have to do to understand that? We had to compare those accounts. We had to contrast those accounts in order for the main point that Luke was making about Jesus to be seen in the light. Now, I think when we're faced with this genealogy, we've got to do something that's similar to that, don't we? We're comparing. If God's given us two genealogies, (laughs) we're to compare them, aren't we? We're to look at Matthew's genealogy. We look at Luke's genealogy in order to see the point that Luke is making. Uh, So for a moment, or just for a moment, this is brief, but for a moment, I want you to think about the end point for both of these genealogies, the end point to Matthew's genealogy and the end point to Luke's genealogy. We're able to bring up on the screen 
Matthew's. So do you see? Oh, it's Matthew 3, not Matthew 1. I can tell you what it says. Everybody knows it by heart anyway. <laughs> you and sniggered. <laughs> Don't blame him too much. Matthew's, Matthew 1. It begins, the end point for Matthew, the focus for Matthew, is the name Abraham, isn't it? So all this momentum is going with Matthew and it's going to Abraham. But if you've got Luke's gospel in front of you just now and his genealogy, do you notice what he does instead? Can we look at it? What do you see? Do you notice that instead of Abraham, that Luke draws things all the way back to Adam? Do we notice that? In fact, would you agree with uh, a scholar? I'll read out what he says. He says this. He says, the key feature... So this is the main point of everything. He says the key feature of Luke's genealogy is that it goes past Abraham and Luke draws Jesus' line back to Adam and in particular his special relationship with God. Okay? Now maybe you want to push back that that's the main point. You won't if I mention a couple of other realities. First of all, think about the placement of Luke's genealogy. So, so how does the New Testament begin? How does Matthew's gospel begin? He's bang, straight in there, isn't he? With the genealogy. It's quite strange. In a way, you open the New Testament, bang! Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy. Isn't it interesting to note that Luke doesn't do that? Luke waits to this very point here in order to insert his genealogy. Are we not asking, well, why? Do you, why? Do you see the answer? So that when we go into the next bit, the temptation of Jesus, where Jesus is face to face with the evil one, with the serpent, Luke draws it to Adam so that we have Genesis 3 in our minds. Do you see? And then you think about the structure. Because, wait a minute, Matthew's account. Do we have Matthew's account, Matthew 1? Yep. Notice what he does. Do you notice that he, which way round is it? Do you notice he begins with Abraham? He goes from Abraham and he works forward to Jesus. Now, if we look at Luke's account of verse 23, what, what, what happens? Do you notice that Luke flicks everything on its head? Luke starts with Jesus, and he builds forward. Now, now, stick with me. What effect does that have for the reader? Do you see what Luke is doing? He's causing you to sit in the edge of your seat. He's, he's saying, the reader asks, well, where are you going with this? Who are you going to end with? Are you going to end with King David? No, it goes past it. Are you going to end with... Abraham? No, he's going past it. Where are you going? You, you see, it's all of this momentum. Why? So that in Luke's gospel, there is a neon flashing light on the name Adam, and especially his role as the first representative of humanity before God. Now, we ask, don't we, Luke, why have you done this? Why all of this attention on Adam? Well, do you get spam emails, Christian friends? You do, don't you? You get lots of them, don't you? You know what it's like, even if you don't. If you're not careful with your email address, you're going to get all of these offers. That are bomb you're going to get bombarded with the all of these offers, aren't you? Sometimes, what are they like? Sometimes these offers are universal. They're for everyone. They'll say, this is not just for existing subscribers. This is not just for present customers. This is an offer for, for, for everyone. Do you not see that that is exactly what Luke, the evangelist, is doing here? Isn't it? I mean, you think about Matthew's gospel. He draws it back to, to Abraham. Why? We know, don't we? That was a primarily Jewish audience. That's why he focuses on Abraham. Do you see what Luke is doing? He draws past Abraham so that everyone would understand. See this gospel? It is an offer to you. It is an offer for all. It is not just for current subscribers. It's not just for the Jews. 
This Lord Jesus has come to engage in this ministry to secure a salvation that it might be offered to all. Who is he? But he is the second Adam. He is the, the real and true, the better Adam. He is the, the last Adam. And so I end this morning with a challenge for, for every single one of you in here. It doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter your stage. And I ask, do you know this Jesus do you, I don't mean, do you know details about his life? I don't, I don't mean, do you know some theological truths about, I mean, do you know him? Like, do you know him personally? Do you know and love Jesus? Because every time, every single time that we're confronted with a biblical genealogy, you and I are reminded that there is another list somewhere, aren't we? Every time we look at this sort of thing, we're reminded that in heaven there is a record. And it is a, a record of Jesus' family. And it's a record of all those who by grace have repented and believed in, in, in Jesus. All those who have turned to him. All those who love him and know him. So do you? Do you? Do you know him personally? Because the truth we all know is that one day that list will be taken out. Before all of the watching, listening world that list will be read. One day, the roll will be called up yonder. On that day, will we hear your name? Will your name be heard? Let's bow and let's pray.